So now let's talk a little bit more about the energetics of this process of the chair flip. So you'll note that I've said multiple times already that the two compounds involved in the chair flip, the starting material and the product, if you will, or the two different conformers, have different energies. As a result, we can reason that one is more stable than the other. What you're looking at here are actual real-life calculations of the energy of the cyclohexanol ring, so cyclohexane with that hydroxyl substituent. And what you can see is that the conformer with the hydroxyl group equatorial, which is this guy right here, and in a line angle drawing, it's this one here. What you can see from that is that that's the lower energy conformer of the two. Here's the axial conformer down there. The line on angle drawing is directly above my head, right there. And you can see that it's more stable by about 0.3 kilocalories per mole. And you might think about why that is at the moment. We see this for a wide variety of substituents, this interesting observation that the equatorial complement, or the substituent that puts the group equatorial, is actually, in fact, more stable than the, excuse me, the conformer that puts the substituent equatorial is more stable than the one that puts it axial. And we'll see why that's the case here in a second. So we see on this slide that axial substituents are destabilized. And this diagram will hopefully help give you an idea of why. So in looking at a substituent that's axial, we see that it's got two other axial substituents only two carbons away, and they're pointing up directly at it. And so what can happen is this hydroxyl group, as that hydrogen swings around, remember that there's free rotation around this uh, carbon-oxygen bond, and so that oxygen-hydrogen bond can swing around and bump into those hydrogens. And when it does that, that's an energy-raising situation. Now imagine if we had the hydroxyl group equatorial. Mm, excuse me. So, of course, if that were the case, we wouldn't see this bumping, because as the OH group rotated, it would be rotating out here in free space and not bump bumping into those axial hydrogens. Because those are two carbons away at the three position relative to the substituent, we call those destabilizing interactions 1-3 diaxial interactions. And actually, to draw these out for you in a little bit more um, explicit form, what we can see is that the oxygen here can bump into the hydrogens. And so just as we've represented steric interactions before as these kind of balls bumping into each other, we see here that the oxygen substituent can do that. As a result, that axial conformation is destabilized relative to what, uh, what the equatorial conformer looks like. All right. Here's a table that illustrates the interesting idea that different substituents have different destabilizations of their axial conformer relative to their equatorial. So what you're looking at here, the numbers may a little bit be a little bit difficult to see, but what you're looking at are numbers that will illustrate the difference in energy between the axial and equatorial conformer. So here's an equi um, axial conformer. We would expect that to be higher in energy than the equatorial. We would expect that to be higher in energy than the equatorial conformer, shown there. And that difference in energy is what's listed here. So we see that the smallest group, CH3, has a value of only 1.74 kilocalories per mole. As we increase it to ethyl, we only, we're only up to 1.8, which is an interesting observation. But when we finally get to tert-butyl, we make a huge jump from 2.2, which is the isopropyl group, to the tert butyl group at 4.7. The reason for this, you can see if you think about, once again, returning to the cyclohexane model. So returning to the model, if we throw on here just an ethyl substituent, looking at this, you can see that the ethyl substituent is able to migrate away from 
the um, is able to migrate away from those axial hydrogens. So even though it can bump into them, it can also occupy a conformation where the ethyl group is actually away from those hydrogens, like so. Now if we add to that two more methyl groups, so if we replace the ethyl group on cyclohexane with a tert butyl group, like so, no matter how we spin this molecule, one of those methyl groups is always going to be pointing towards the center. So we could put it like that, we could put it like that, but then the methyl groups would be pointing directly at the hydrogens. So there's really no way for that tert butyl group to get out of the way. And that's why we see the larger destabilization, the, the huge jump in destabilization, when we add a methyl group onto the isopropyl group, which is what you're looking at here. So that's key to keep in mind. And this idea that different substituents have different A values or different destabilizations is going to become important when we start talking about disubstituting and polysubstituting cyclohexanes, which we're about to do. So a question you might be thinking about is, of course, we've identified that for monosubstituted cyclohexanes, the axial conformer is less stable than the equatorial conformer. But you may be wondering, what happens if we have a disubstituted cyclohexane going on? Well, in the disubstituted case, we have the interesting problem that one of the substituents may have to be axial at all times. So in the top example here, I've got the case that's pretty simple to solve. We have two substituents on the ring, a tert butyl group right here. That's the carbon with three uh, methyl groups attached. And the hydroxyl group right here, same on this other guy, this other conformer. We see that in one conformer, we have both substituents equatorial. In the other one, we have both substituents axial. So clearly, it's going to be this conformer here that's going to be the most stable of the two, right? But now down here, the situation gets a little bit more complicated. And it's complicated by the fact that one substituent has to be axial. The way we decide which substituent will be axial in the more stable conformer is to go to a table like the one on the last slide. And if we do that, we can see that the value for the tert butyl group is 4.7 kilocalories per mole, while the value for the hydroxyl group, actually not listed, but based on our calculation, is only 0.3. So in other words, the energetic penalty we pay for putting the hydroxyl group axial is substantially less, it's only 0.3 kilocalories per mole, relative to the much larger 4.7 kilocalories per mole energy we have to pay to put the tert butyl group axial. And that's why when deciding between these two conformers, we would choose the one that puts the tert butyl group equatorial as the most stable conformer. So it would be this one right here. That conformer right there would be the most stable uh, of the two because it puts that tert butyl group axial, uh, equatorial, excuse me. And actually, because the tert butyl group's A value is so large, you can use it to lock the conformation of cycloalkanes. So these two molecules are actually related by a chair flip but you're going to see almost none of this molecule on the left here, on my left. The reason for that is because the tert butyl group really, really, really wants to occupy that equatorial position. So there's going to be very little of that axial tert butyl group around at any one time. That can influence reactivity in very profound ways that we'll uh, talk about in more detail in Chapter 4.